the challenge for Star Trek Picard season two. It's never going to be just a show about a crew of a starship that's part of Starfleet. Oh, really? You might want to tell that to TV Guide so they don't lie to millions of viewers next season. No, no, really, really, Jean-Luc, Data, Riker, and the Next Generation crew are back on the bridge. No, they weren't, TV Guide. No, they weren't, and they're not going to be next season either, if there is one. Hello, everyone. I am MechaRandom42, the one, the only, the original, your favorite YouTube harpy. We're talking Star Trek today. Don't give me the Star Trek crap. It's too early in the morning. <laughs> I know, I'd much rather be talking about Red Dwarf, but hey, I just did a video on that. Go check that one out. That's a positive video. We are talking Star Trek, and you know what? Like any good Star Trek article deserves. We deserve the theme music for this one. <sighs> is a Hollywood Reporter article that we're talking about and they've interviewed Michael Shabon. you know greetings small humans Michael Shabon, that guy definitely check out his story time they're way more entertaining than anything we're getting out of Star Trek um just slow him down a little bit he sounds a little bit like he partakes Smoke when weed every day. he completely misses the mark of some of the books he's reading as well it's kind of hilarious I read through this article. I don't know how much of this I can tolerate right now because this article is a bunch of gobbledygook. It is just a bunch of double talk gobbledygook that tries to justify what am Star Trek now. And I guess there, there's just one, one picture I got to show you that really, really sums up Star Trek. And shout out to Red Letter Media. This is on their feed. They posted this one. So we, we have our crew, our wonderful crew, starting with little robot chick, Doge, Soji, whatever they're calling her, this one, easily convinced to almost murder the entire galaxy. Seven of Nine comes in. She is now a mass murderer. You have a, the psychopathic killer who is Elron, who chopped off people said, oh yeah, I'm not even gonna show you those images anymore. Agnes, Al Agnes, I keep calling her Alice. She also, she killed Dr. Maddox. You have Rafi, who's still partaking in a heavy, heavy drink, drink, smoke, smoke. Smoke weed every Captain day. Rios, who's covered it all up. And Patrick Stewart there, who is now just a clone. He's just a clone. He's not even Picard anymore. Get that off my screen. He's just a clone, a copy. They just put him in an Android body without improving anything. It's like, oh no, no, we're just going to give you a couple more years. Maybe. I mean, he could go out and get hit by a bus the next day and it'd be completely wasted on him. Oh, this, this am so wonderful. Wonderful murder trick. Let's see what Hollywood reporter has to say to justify Picard's existence in this universe. Star Trek Picard producers Michael Shabon and Akiva Goldsman were among a few who saw the end of Jean-Luc Picard's life coming. The plan to bring Patrick Stewart's iconic Star Trek The Next Generation captain back to the small screen for the first time since 1994 was always intended to boldly go where no season one finale took it. With Picard's sacrifice and resurrection. Uh, be, why? Why do you need him sacrificed and then resurrected? What point does that prove exactly? Their only point to bring in all of these iconic characters anyway is just to extort our nostalgia dollar because we remember these characters. That's all it is. It's just, hey, remember Patrick Stewart? Remember? Remember Data? This is why we had this. This, this TV Guide propaganda piece because it's just Jean-Luc, Data Riker, and the Next Generation crew back on the bridge. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Not only that, it wasn't even Data. It was just a flash drive of his memories. 
How exactly to use the show's first season to get there was less clear, but the chance to resolve Picard's arc this way was worth the complex creative journey. No, it wasn't. It really wasn't. If you think that sitting there being bored to death with the most gratuitous, violent, disgusting Star Trek ever was worth it, then I have no hope for humanity. But hey, that's exactly, this is exactly what we need in today's dark times is this. This to be uplifting and hopeful and optimistic. To devalue human life so much that, that this, this am Star Trek now. I gotta pull it up again. That this am Star Trek now. And if that's not the message to this show, then they need to do a better job explaining it. And I tried. I went through this Hollywood Reporter article. This is a bunch of double talk gobbledygook. I was reading this this morning and I'm like, I had to send this over to, to Rob from Midnight's Edge and double check this. I'm like, did I have a stroke? Am I still baked from last Stop night? No, day. no, I didn't. This is just a bunch of gobbledygook double talk. We didn't decide to do this to the character from a place of we didn't want to have future seasons or anything like that. Shaban tells Hollywood Reporter in a post-mortem discussion, oh, that's a great word for it, post-mortem discussion about the first season's conclusion from the original plan for the show, even though our original outline changed significantly to what you eventually saw, the plan, and Sir Patrick Stewart's plan from the beginning was, let's tell more stories with Picard. Well, you could have done that in so many ways. They didn't, I don't know, murder him. They didn't kill him. They didn't insult your audience. But hey, you know, I have no answers to why they want to insult the audience like that. The answer is All right, I get it. Nerd! Nerd! They don't like Star Trek fans. They clearly don't. And that's obvious if you read through any of these. We'll continue. We'll continue. In January, Picard executive producer Alex Kurtzman told Hollywood Reporter that none of their original pitch doc for the first season made it to the shooting of the final project. Oh yeah, that's because you had whatever story you had, and then you had a bunch of us yelling on YouTube saying, hey, watch Measure of a Man, watch Drumhead, watch these episodes, and actually process them. And they watched about two seconds of them, didn't make it to the end, they were probably on their phones texting because it was probably too boring for them. And they decided they knew what it was based on a couple of little lines of the plot synopsis. Oh, yeah, Bruce Maddox is building an army of datas. They didn't get the point of the episode where, you know, maybe don't build a whole bunch of androids. Don't build a whole bunch of synths. And they continue. So, yes, none of this... <laughs> That story document written by Shabon Kurtzman and Goldsman also didn't feature data. Oh yeah, you know why they brought in data? Because because he would sell. He would bring in all of us old fans on our nostalgia dollar. And that's all this is, is extorting the nostalgia dollar and then telling us, oh, no, 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 no. You Trek fans, you old people are not smart enough for, I even had people tell me, oh, it's for people over 30. Okay, so I'm 41. How is this for me? Because this insults my intelligence. And when story time with Stone Uncle Michael Shabon is more entertaining, and check out his channel, then they really, really missed the mark on Star Trek. They're not giving us anything that is quality. At least I know story time is for little ones and my channel is not. And if you do like the content, like, subscribe, share. I do have the jiggle cam initiated most of the time. <laughs> and they wanted it to unfold in a very peak TV binge friendly way. Oh, you can't binge, who can binge this? None of these episodes make sense within themselves. You are playing this like it is a movie that does not go from beginning to end, but it goes from, oh crap, um, let's change the ending and then fill in the blanks of how we got to the ending last minute. That is apparent, and that is exactly what they did, and they've admitted to it time and time again. When you do listen to the deadline interviews, they do go into detail, and they confirm that they got to episode 7 
of season one and none of it made sense. They had to go back in and reshoot everything. And episode seven was the one where we finally got in Riker. All the Riker stuff was reshoots. We've been complaining about this since its inception, and now they're going to try and blame us because they didn't have a strong enough product that they were confident in that made sense when they showed it to whoever higher up they had to approve, right? Whoever the higher up was that they had to say, yes, make this, put this on air. Whoever made that call said, no, 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 this is not good enough, do all these reshoots. And it's still, this is what we got. We got the most uninteresting, unpleasant, boring slog of hateful nonsense just spewing forth from every character in that show. Shut the fuck up. The article continues. You really have to binge watch the whole thing in 10 episodes, Shabon says. And it's a tricky thing because of the whole episodic versus serialized way we watch things and how especially Star Trek audiences are sort of trained to expect more of the episodic mission of the week structure and that's not what the show is. But the problem is you have a mishmash of gobbledygook in your show. You have this disjointed mess of reshoots and things that you didn't have a point A and point B set out, storyboarded, blocked out to where it all makes sense before you started filming. What you did was you split up a 10 hour movie into 10 episodes of nonsense. And you had to stretch out one little story into 10 episodes over 10 weeks to extort as much money from CBS All Access subscribers as you possibly could. And that is the problem. And now you're telling us, oh yes, binge watch it all in one shot. Well, maybe you should have released it all in one shot and we could have gotten this nightmare over with a little bit quicker. But no, they didn't do that. They decided to break it up into the most redundant, boring mess of a slog of unpleasant and uninteresting garbage. Shabon believes Star Trek Discovery's emphasis on serialized storytelling helped prime the pump for audiences' experience with Picard's more novelistic narrative approach, specifically when it came to ending the retired Starfleet officer's life opposite losing his lost android friend. Um, but Data really wasn't his friend. He was an officer under his command. This was one of the great organizing ideas of the season. The final sit down between Picard and Data, Goldsman adds. This idea of how Picard could face and take off the anchors of his own guilt surrounding the loss of his friend was part of what we were driving to from the beginning. Well, there's your problem. First off, Picard and Data were not really friends. He probably was more annoyed by Data than he finally came to kind of respect him as an officer. But here's the thing. Picard sends people to their deaths all the time. That is part of being in command. Data did exactly what a trained Starfleet officer would have done. He would have sacrificed himself to save the ship, his fellow crew members. That is what the military officers in Starfleet tend to do. This is why they need a freaking military advisor on this show. We've been screaming that for so long. That is one of the problems. But no, they never bothered to actually watch Star Trek and understand any of it. And we've actually touched on this. There's an episode in Next Generation. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but Picard ends up having kind of a little bit of a romance with a scientist. And he sends her to a planet and she almost dies because of it. And then that kind of breaks up their romance. This is the one where they're all sneaking off and playing piano. Or she, he's playing his flute and she's playing her little rollout piano thing, which is actually kind of cool. This, that type of thing was handled then, and that is when he took a step back from his subordinates and realized, yes, this is a job. If these people had ever watched Star Trek The Next Generation, they would understand a lot more of the big picture of it. And I'm not talking, and I do not argue the semantics and the little details, because at the end of the day, canon violations, the inconsistencies, the cheap sets, the bad acting, the bad lighting, anything could be forgiven if it was the hopeful, optimistic, actual Star Trek feel, especially now, because there is nothing that I love more in this day and age where we're going through the crap we're going through than looking at Star Trek and seeing the glorification of genocidal maniacs, the glorification of murderers, and the lack of consequences of anybody in this show for anything. That is something we really, 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 really love and need in this day and age. This is the power of math, people! Come on! You are correct, 
to get there. The thematic temple the writers used early on was a dream Picard had about Data, where they're back in the Enterprise at 10 forward. As things change about the series and the season as it evolves, this dream and Picard's fate never change. Except you could really use 10 forward because you would have had to, I don't know, build something that actually looked like 10 forward and you couldn't use your crapping Discovery sets, right? And here's the thing, that's one, of, one more thing about Discovery is that you can take the Discovery ship that Riker flies in on in the final episode and saves the day in, and it doesn't look that out of place. And that was one of the problems with discovery. But hey, what do I know? I'm just a nerd. The answer is nerd! 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 And every time I go and think about what should have been in Star Trek, I feel like I am getting picked on by the jocks back in high school or elementary school even who just want to pick on you for being a nerd again. And this is exactly the same type of crap I'm going through. I was bullied for liking Star Trek, and now I'm bullied for not liking Star Trek. It's the same crap. And I'm sorry, this just isn't Star Trek anymore. Here we go. The idea of bringing Seven of Nine back. Oh, I know why. I know exactly why you brought her back because she's one of the ones that you see when you search images of Star. She's one of the memes, isn't she? Bringing Seven of Nine back and seeing her Borg pass interact with Picard's, it was just too rich to pass up on. Shabon says, Seven is a character both Shabon and Goldsman wish they really could have spent more time with, especially upon seeing Seven hold Rafi's hand. All right, here we go. I got, I got to get into that. I got into that one because I don't need to be pandered to in that way. I am a B in the LGBT community. I do not need Seven of Nine to change her preferences over the course of a season so I can feel better about my life choices. I do not need a fictional character in a TV series to represent anything about me. I can identify with a black actor who plays a kitty cat on a science fiction show more than I can identify with Seven of Nine now because now she's a heartless, cold, calculated, alcoholic, drug addict, murderer, just like the chick she's banging. And the fact that you changed her preferences out of what's already been established just to pander to the alphabet community is insulting to all of us and you know it. I don't need a TV show to tell me my life choices are okay and anybody who is so weak-minded that they need representation on TV to tell them that they're okay really needs to reevaluate what's actually important in their lives and grow personality because I'm tired of this whole crapping representation shit. I'm tired of this whole pandering to audiences like that and using that as a shield from criticism because what you're doing now is you're hiding behind the alphabet community or the community of color. You are using them. You are using them for for what? To keep people from criticizing it. Because if I say somebody like Michael Burnham is a crapping, horrible character, it has nothing to do with the color of her skin. It has everything to do with the fact that that character would be crap if it were played by an old white dude or a monkey or a kangaroo for fuck's sake. No matter what it would be, played by it is a bad character on a bad tv show and i do not need seven of nine to change her preferences just to appease me or the community all right you got it especially from akiva effing goldsman who i've heard countless times being referred to as the guy who makes derogatory statements about the stamix character going around mocking him and using the f word that degrades people of the alphabet community, of the LGBT community. So don't you tell me anything about anything coming from this series, the way you treat people of that community coming from behind the scenes. Okay? Okay, you got it? And I'm counting that as true because I've seen how hateful and horrible these people are. They come out with these articles and these interviews saying it's our fault for not being smart enough to like it. They do nothing but attack and provoke and antagonize and they flat out say, yes, go and defend this. Go get into fights, go into arguments and tell people that they're wrong for not liking it. No, no, if you like this show, that is fine. You do not need to argue with me to justify your liking of a show. If you have a strong enough conviction in what you like and what you don't like, you do not need to get into arguments with me about why I don't. Because a lot of the time I'm just venting. I'm pissed off. I'm frustrated with this mess. 
So we're just going to, oh, here you go. Here you go. If you sit down and rewatch, you'd see a hint or two there throughout the season of Seven and Rafi just getting to know each other. The first hint is in the full episode of Seven Appears In on Free Cloud as Rafi is putting handcuffs on Seven. There's a moment between them, a physical gesture. And in that moment, I think is when you start to feel some kind of a connection. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because just because you happen to be next to a person does not mean you're going to be doing the giggity with them. Unless you're a huge old promiscuous slut bag, which is fine, it's fine. Do not tell me that that's an actual romance and nothing more than Seven just being an absolute slut now, which degrades her character. She was too prudish. She was too stuck up and snobbish to be like that. She wouldn't change completely and go from I'm proper Seven of Nine to, hi, I'm Annika. I'm a completely different person. I'm not Seven anymore. Seven's dead. Who the fuck are you? Taylor fucking Swift. Siobhan's other main concern was avoiding the scene, feeling like they were milking it for melodrama. This is about the, the Patrick Stewart Brent Spiner scene. No, you're milking it for melodrama. You made it as slow as possible. You had everybody crying their eyes out over Patrick Stewart over, you know, because he dies at the end, but he's not really dead because they just put him in an android body. So they, that was clearly a reshoot because why would you spend 20 minutes of them crying their eyes out for nothing? For nothing, right? Because he's there. It doesn't matter. There's absolutely no consequences to anything in this show. Everybody who's a murderer gets let go. For uh, And same thing happened in Discovery. Both Shabon and Goldsman are currently at work shaping up the story for Star Trek Picard's upcoming second season. Oh, I thought Shabon was out. He's no longer showrunner. So who is now? Because they got rid of him and they were going to give him a TV series or something. And then people said, wait, 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 that's problematic. That's an ish. That's fault. Somebody threw a fit over it. I don't know the whole story, but... Here's the thing. Why does he care? I thought he was out the door. Maybe he's not. Maybe they gave him the second season because he's got nothing else to do. Maybe we're stuck with this guy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> They're shaping the story for Picard season two, which finds Picard, his new body, and his new crew set out to explore the final frontier once again in ways that Shaban promises will honor that which the first season started telling star trek in familiar but new and emotionally challenging ways oh you're getting an emotional response out of me it's just not the one you think because i see this i see this every time and shout out to red letter media thank you so much for making that i i love you guys so much oh the last paragraph of this it's almost over and that's the challenge shaban says first it's got to be good right it has to be <laughs> <laughs> oh wait you're serious let me laugh even harder <laughs> i wasn't gonna use bender anymore but man that's a perfect place for it yes first it has to be good it has to be good before you do anything. You have to kind of have some sort of understanding of what people who sign up for Star Trek are actually signing up for. And the fact that I get messages from people who aren't even viewers of mine yet, right? Just saying, I am so emotionally crushed by what they did with Seven of Nine. I am emotionally crushed by Picard. How did Patrick Stewart allow this? And I am destroyed that I have to tell them and be the bearer of bad news that he wanted this. He would not have done the show if it wasn't this. He does not want to do Star Trek anymore. He's done that. And I get it. I get it. But why would you come back to it? just to destroy it why would you come back to it if it has to be so different that we don't even recognize it as star trek and that's the biggest problem i'm seeing with ent the entirety with the entirety of everything that is modern star trek is that it just has to be good. It just has to be in the spirit of Star Trek. It has to be something that's going to get me through my day to say, hey, I can trust that people are going to do the right thing and be decent people out there. And it used to be that. It used to be something where we got past all of our petty separatism, you know, our petty differences. If people were a different shade or species, what does it matter? They're still people and we treated them equally. Not like they were a diversity point on a giant game of Wokemon for these people to hide behind. Wokemon. Just to prove that they're not is to each other over in their Hollywood fart sniffing circles. Shabon, you don't get it. 
check out this article if you want to be enraged. I am MechaRandom42, and I will see you guys on the next video, live stream, or wherever. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, make sure to hit that like button. And if you want to see more, don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye.